We hope you enjoy listening to this weekly podcast from Lifeline Church. Find out more by visiting lifelinechurch.co.uk. Good morning, everyone. Well, um, it's been a while since I've uh, spoken. Um, and, um, actually, well, not actually literally, obviously, because I still ask for, you know, cups of tea and things. But, but also, um, in this kind of context, it's kind of strange, isn't it? I'm used to getting audience participation and feedback. So uh, those lucky few that I can see above my face, if you could look particularly animated, so that's Nick, no slouching on the sofa. I've heard what you did last week. Um, You know, Matthew, if you can, Stanford, if you can just sort of jiggle up and down, if you get excited, that would really help me. Um, But it's almost like going back to my day job. Some of you might know I'm a teacher and um, spent most of last term attached to my computer speaking to classes of children who may or may not have been there. Uh, And so this is kind of a return to that exciting world for me. But it's not, because this morning I really feel like God's given me something to share, which I think is very important. And um, I'm not saying that what I share at school isn't important, but this is of a different nature. This morning I want to talk to you about um, making a fresh start. About 39 years ago, I went to a place that looked like this. That rather snazzy looking building, which you may be able to see, um, was the state school that I went to in Barnet. Um, It's called Queen Elizabeth Boys School. Um, And um, I went there as a fearful 11 year old. Now I realize that some of you will be listening and there will be 11 year olds in the room. Um, however bad you think it's going to be, it's not going to be as bad as you think. It's, it's brilliant. Secondary school is a wonderful place. But I want to tell you about my experience of 39 years ago. Don't have nightmares. So when we, when we were all taken in, there were 180 boys. Now, this place ruled by fear. Um, it, it really was. It was, like the, it was like the idea that what could happen um, if you had 180 boys without being told what to do all the, t- all the time um, in each year. And um, so, so when we were welcomed, the welcome was not quite the same as the welcome as we give today. So the welcome was done by somebody who looks a little bit like that rather angry looking man in the tie. His name was Mr. Shirley. Now, Mr. Shirley had been a pupil at the school. And at the time he was welcoming me, although I didn't realise this, he was about a year from retirement. So as far as I was concerned, he he was probably like the Ancient of Days. He was really the most old person I could imagine. And I remember his welcoming assembly and he sat across a table. Now I'm sitting at a table today and um, although you can't see it, I'm sitting at a table. Those of you who know my house, you can imagine where I am. And as he spoke to us, he made a certain point of emphasis on that table to drive home his point that as far as he was concerned, every single boy in that school, he didn't care where they'd been before or how they'd been before, but they were making a new start. Well, I was quite bothered by this uh, because I'd really worked rather hard, as you can imagine, and I'm a sensitive soul. So here I was amongst all this riffraff that I didn't know, and I really was quite afraid. And I was being told that it didn't matter whether I'd been a good boy or a bad boy before, but that actually in this new place, I was making a fresh start. I didn't want a fresh start. I thought I tried really hard and I really quite liked where I was at. I had no reputation at all. It was like, despite all my efforts, those had all in a moment. And as I told my mum when I got home, why would I want to start afresh? In 2013, um, I had an exciting experience. This is another exciting experience. A combination of changes in regulations regarding cars free points from my brother's credit card and various other um, treats meant that I could buy a new car. The excitement of driving from the forecourt was amazing. I went to the uh, garage and collected our shiny blue Safira. And as I drove it home, it had done 13 miles in its entire life. It was shiny, it was new, it was wonderful. We went to Asda in Romford and somebody drove a shopping trolley into it. Within a week, it already had dents and scratches all over it. And to be honest, 
that's a bit like most of things in life, isn't it? We get new things and they get messed up. We think they're great at the time, but slowly and surely things get done to them. And now, 64,000 miles later, it doesn't look like a new car anymore. I don't know about you, but I love new things. Do you remember that feeling you had at school when you got a new exercise book? I mean, for me, I still live with this, but the, the, the new exercise book, crisply out of the packet, you open it and nobody has made any mistakes in it. You write in that first page like it's like so precious and you write and you write and you write and you may if you're me you make a mistake on the very first page and you get really cross but that smell when you first get it is so exciting isn't it because you have a fresh start and every time you get that new book make a fresh start now i've been mulling over the story of jesus and nicodemus nicodemus was a man who was a pharisee in the new testament times who was around at the time of Jesus. And the reason why it's become sort of live to me, I suppose, is, is because, uh, well, because we, um, my, my daughter Lydia, she's very good at picking up these things. And she talked to me about this thing called The Chosen. And I know a number of you have been watching it. And um, after watching this series, she said, oh, my, one of my favorite characters, she can correct me later if I'm getting this wrong. One of my favourite characters is Nicodemus. And I, and I thought, well, that's a funny thing, because I, I don't really remember Nicodemus being particularly profound. And I, and I, I thought I'd watch the programme. And I, what I want to do is to look at 10 verses that are recorded in the Gospel of John from John chapter 3 to talk a little bit about a conversation that took place. And I want us to think about what it was like for Nicodemus and see if we can see some of our own experience in it. Now, there was a man, a Pharisee, called Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one could perform the signs you're doing if you're not with him. But Jesus replied, very truly, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again or born from above. How can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless of the water and of the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you can't tell. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be, Nicodemus asked. You're Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. Nicodemus was, uh, had many things to recommend him. Um, Nicodemus was someone who feared God. Um, he was someone who was someone who, who'd got a job of helping others to understand God. Now, we, from our perspective today, believe the Pharisees have got many things wrong. But in his day, he would have been someone who was trying to please God, it, at least in his, his mind, he was trying to do that. Not only was he a Pharisee, he was a member of the ruling council. He studied and he taught um, and he was a respected member of the community. And yet he sees something in Jesus that stirs his spirit. Maybe you're here today because you've seen something in Jesus that stirs you, something that you can't quite put your finger on. Why would he come at night? And really, what, what, was, what was this whole conversation about? Well, Jesus was pretty busy in the daytime, um, maybe, but more particularly, because I have a feeling that if Jesus had wanted to meet with him, he would have found the time. I think the Pharisee was pretty busy in the daytime doing his day job. And I think also the Pharisee, Nicodemus, probably didn't want to be seen joining in with this weirdo, Jesus. At this time and at this stage in our communities, it's possible for us to church without going to church. At this time, it's possible for us to have a look and see. And actually, no one really needs to know that we're doing it. In fact, that's what we find, that at this time, when, when we don't need to 
do things obviously, it's much easier to investigate. And I hope and pray that this morning you might be here because you're having a look, because there's something about Jesus that you want to know more about. And there is something in this man that changes our lives. We don't know how old Nicodemus was. It doesn't tell us. But in the, what we do have the impression is he's a man of status. And, um, and Nicodemus is, has been at this game this game of being a Pharisee for some time. I think that one of the things that comes across to me in this story is this is a story about someone who has been walking their way with God for a long time and is now pausing to think, is what I've been doing the right thing? As I look in this story, I see something of my own life. I imagine Nicodemus could have been someone about my age. I could imagine that he worked really hard to do things that he thought were pleasing God. And in this story, we're seeing someone being asked, are you willing to lay down what you've done in order to follow me? You see, the thing is that some time ago, God spoke to me through um, a London City missioner when I was about 10. Uh, and he said that some people see connecting with God is a bit like... You know, now we've just come back off holiday and and one of the things we love to do is i say love to do i'm saying we love to do it and store so they can't contradict me and we love to climb mountains okay but one of the things about climbing a mountain is you get to a point when it's not really very much fun and you just have to kind of keep your head down and keep on walking don't you and so for some of us our spiritual lives can be like that for some some of us, our spiritual lives can be, well, I'm just going to keep my head down and just get, get, keep on going. And I think for Nicodemus, that's the kind of life that he was in. Now, this London City missioner explained to me when I was about nine or ten. He said, you know, you don't need to keep on trying to get to the top. Jesus has made it possible for you to get to the top by his grace. If you trust in him, if you accept what he's done for you, if you allow him to rule in your life, then he takes you and he puts you right at the very top. We find ourselves on the top of a mountaintop, not because of our efforts, but because of his grace. Like my car, we can be made new. But unlike my car, we don't get dented and scratched because actually he makes us new every day. God wants to make you new today. God wants to deal with the dents and the scratches. God wants to deal with the, the past hurts. You know, the Bible talks about those that uh, trust in God will bear fruit in old age. You know, I believe that God wants to reach some of us that are feeling a bit older than we used to be. But actually, God wants you to find his grace on the mountaintop. Perhaps there's something old, getting old in your life. And I'm not talking about your partner. That's not true. But perhaps there's something getting old, getting old in your life that you ask for. God wants to make it new. Bring those things to him because those things that are born from above will last forever. The things that are born of the flesh can only ever be flesh and will always pass away. But the things that are born from above will last forever. When Jesus said in Revelation 21, 5, he said, I am making all things new. And I believe that for today, some of you want to know that newness. I'm glad God met me when I was young. Um, and that it was later that God filled me with his spirit. Um, but, but, you know, that was a, a tremendous journey that he brought me on. And... Um, I'm just so uh, grateful for that, for that walk that he gave with me. But I still need to remember that no matter how many years I've been walking, I can't improve on the place that God's given for me. God has put me at the top of the mountain and I've been made new completely. Perhaps you're at the start of the journey. Uh, perhaps you've got more miles on the clock, but God's calling you to commit your life to him to follow his rule. Like Nicodemus, you have to see the spirit like the wind. Which way is the wind blowing this morning? 
We don't know where it comes from and we don't necessarily know where it's going, but we know who's going to be with us when we commit our lives to him. The saying goes, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. God, his spirit, has promised to be with us. And in that, we know that he is always there and always alongside. I just want to pause a moment because I don't want to rush on. I believe that God is saying something to us about the significance of those of you that are looking to approach God from the back door, as it were, a secret place, a kind of looking without committing. You know it's okay to do that. And and if you're looking this morning, God wants to welcome you inside. And at the end of the meeting, there'll be an opportunity to, to have someone pray with you. If you want to commit your life to him, he, we, will, we will have people available. Peter Grieg says that the back door is bigger than our front door and has a long and winding driveway. You know, I don't know what journey has brought you here this morning, but I believe that God is making a way for you to reconnect with him. Nicodemus saw what Jesus was doing and thought it was great, but he couldn't see the kingdom until he was born from above. Talking about God and understanding him is a great thing to do. He's trying to understand his, the Bible, trying to battle around things. These are all good things. But until you're born from above, you don't really get it. So I'd encourage you this morning, if you're looking, ask God to help you to be born of the Spirit, to be born from above. Because if you're born from above, then all these things fall into place. Imagine a country where you could only be a, uh, a member if you were born there. You see, it wouldn't matter if you tried to speak the same. It wouldn't matter if you tried to dress the same. It wouldn't matter if you tried to dress uh, like everyone there. It wouldn't matter if you perhaps picked up a few of the practices of the, of the, the customs. Uh, if you weren't actually born in that nation, you couldn't be part of it. God says that we need to be born into his kingdom in order to be part of it. So I just, want to, I just want to finish with this. Being born again gives us a completely new start. It gives us a, not a start at the bottom, like my teacher made me feel, but a start at the top. He puts us into a place that is new. But it's not new in a temporary way, in the way that would wear out. Romans 6 4 tells us that we've been made for new forever. He deals with, he fun, and finally, he deals with our tendency to mess things up. Um, he deals with our, what's, what, what the Bible talk calls our sinful nature, our heart, which tends to get things wrong and mess up. God gives us a new beginning, a new heart, a new new place to make those decisions so that's where i'm going to finish this morning and i just want to leave that with you to to think about is it time for you to reach out to him and say lord i don't know where you're going to take me and i and i don't know i don't know why i've been through the things i've been through but what i do know is the future is one i want you to be in and i want to follow you if that's how you feel, then there'll be people available to pray with you. Thank you for listening to this podcast by Lifeline Church. We hope this message has been an encouragement to you. We are a relational church with a passion to demonstrate God's love to one another and our surrounding community in real and practical ways. We believe that God has called us to have an impact on our families, our communities and our nation. We'd love to connect further with you, so please do visit our website at lifelinechurch.co.uk, on Facebook, lifeline.church.uk or Twitter at lifelineuk.com.